Rejection zone in attacks with the complex, creating conflicts to the predestined commission. Plasmic plight pools too tight, choking petitions of the sin of cavity. Dictional depravity, nothing can express, so it suggests this has to be. Confusion at the crest, apex of apathy. Dissolution cortex suppressed, the sadly. Situation at hand, confiscation of plants. Put staggers to the stance and bruises badly. Banging swords on the self, bringing poor to the health. Changing more than I felt through this tragedy. Tiresome travails prevail to flatten me while I ring for help. Yo, oh Lord, give me the strength in you, peace and joy I find. And as I look on upon another day, renew my mind. Oh Lord, give me the strength in you, peace and joy I find. And as I look on upon another day, renew my mind. My, 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 my. No joy is spread when I'm tasting trials. Boy, I've read, but I'm claiming denial. Production of patience forces face to test. Percussion of sensations, more weight upon the flesh. Flinging my weak soul to the wall, wounding, tingling my spine. I'm dying, calls the grooming, give up some time. Letting behind to lack luster and shine that in the past used to attract. Human perceptions, steer clear misconceptions. Somehow I backtrack to civilized terrain. Swimming with the minnows, flowing with the rain. Neglecting all the narrow calls, I can't stand pain. Please, God, help me plainly, no more to stay the same. Serious as it gets, flesh would rather remain. Rubbish in the depths of deranged domain. So give me, give me strength as I call upon your name. Oh Lord, give me the strength. Wait a second. Peace and joy I find. And as I look on upon another day. A lyrical masterpiece, I unleash the dolphin and accelerate. Aware of the traps that reside, beware of the crap and confide in the creator or the greater. Hollywood plate, sets of systems that rape my eyes, but I won't gouge. I remain on cloud dust. I never fight no fuss, just bust it to my rim to flush away my sorrow. Praying for tomorrow that it happens today, but I'm napping away. All the blueprints sustain in the archives of the mind. They resist the play, I attempt to unforce, but the flaws won't give way to Pop's plan. Now, I understand procrastination, yet I rest. In the depths of the incorrect life of the flesh Just congest cortex, snaps next, wacker than you guess I got a rich set Oh Lord, give me the strength And you peace and joy I find And as I look on upon another day Renew my mind Oh Lord, give me the strength And you peace and joy I find And as I look on upon another day Renew my mind So that implies that this notion that, that we go about our everyday lives with a, a thinking of ourselves as separate from each other and the cup is separate from the coffee that goes in the cup, that, that these notions are, are, are somehow, what would you say, superficial or contradicted at a deeper level? Uh, they're, well, they're artificial, definitely, and, and Bohm really stresses this. And it, it's, it's a very interesting notion because in our Western way of thinking, we're so attached to the idea that when we come up with a concept like a, an apple or an electron or whatever that that exists out there and we forget it's kind of like fish unaware of the water in which they swim that the conceptual pigeonholes we use words to to describe reality 
are phenomena inside our head. They're not out there. And most of the time, this is a philosophical quibble. When, but when you get down to quantum physics, and this is one of the reasons that Bohm came up with the holographic idea, it, it starts to have real effects. And one of those is it's been discovered that if you take uh, two subatomic particles, like electrons, and in certain instances, when you do something to one, it will always affect the other, no matter how far apart they are. It's kind of like stories that you've heard of identical twins, where when one is hurt, the other feels the pain. And the problem is, is that we can find no process known to physics that explains how these could be sending a signal back and forth. In fact, because it would have to be faster than the speed of light. Instantaneous. It would have mm -hmm. to be an instantaneous signal. And Einstein's theory of relativity said you can't have instantaneous signals because it would mean that you could uh, violate the time barrier and, and conceivably call your grandfather and tell him not to marry your grandmother. And most physicists say, well, this would be just too troubling to, to incorporate into a, a rational picture of reality. Um, Bohm explains it in a different way, which is a very interesting way, and he says, if you imagine that you've got an aquarium in which you have a fish swimming, you have a TV camera facing the front of the aquarium, one facing the side of the aquarium, and you have a monitor attached to each camera. Now, you also imagine further that you come from a culture that's never seen aquariums, never seen fish, never seen monitors or cameras. All you are privy to is the two images on, this, on these screens. He says that maybe, you know, if you look at these two screens, you're going to see a fish, at, uh, a side view of a fish and a frontal view of a fish. And if you, because you don't know what the deeper reality is, the reality of the aquarium, you may assume that these are two separate things. And, but two different fish. Two different fish, two different objects. But every time one fish moves, the other is going to make a corresponding movement. Mm -hmm. And you may then jump to the conclusion that somehow the one fish is signaling the other, or communicating the other to say, hey, do this, instantaneously. And Bohm says this is what we've done with subatomic particles, that we assume that an instantaneous communication is going on, when that's not really what's going on at all. At a deeper level, a very holographic level of reality, every particle in the universe collapses to a sort of cosmic unity. They're not signaling each other. They're like that fish where there's the, the level of the aquarium. And so what that means, talking about words, is that there is no separation between electrons. Furthermore, there's no separation between people. And this has all kinds of very boggling uh, implications, one of which um, is that we've always tried to understand, for example, psychic phenomena, like how could I get information out of your head and my head as some sort of signal going back and forth. But if we're organized, if we live in a universe that's organized holographically, you no longer have to tackle it that way. It could be that I have the entire universe and every neuron, every cell, every atom, every electron in my head, and you do also. So when we can access that, we can access information that seems to be beyond our normal sensory reach. Well, you know, I'm very interested in psychic phenomena, and I know you've had many personal experiences, right. and I, I want to touch on it, but this is not a model that was developed in order to explain psychic phenomena. I think to neuropsychologists like Carl Pregram, the, the fact that it happens to it, it provide an explanation for psychic phenomena is almost a bit of an embarrassment, that he developed the holographic model because he was trying to come to terms with memory. Right. So right. Let, let's talk about that. Sure. Um, Pribram was working under a, a very famous neurophysiologist named Carl Lashley, and it was at a time when it was believed that memory was stored in a specific spot in the brain, and there was something called the proverbial grandmother cell, but there was literally a cell in your brain that contained the memory of your grandmother, what you knew about your grandmother. And so they did a rather gruesome series of experiments for animal lovers, but it came out with some very profound inf uh, information. They took rats and they taught them how to run mazes. And then they would surgically remove various portions of the brain, Cribben and his, his um, mentor, Carl Ashley. The reasoning being that if they found a, if they could remove the, a, a portion of the brain and the rat could no longer run the maze, they found the area of the brain where the rat's memory of the maze running ability was encoded. Now, every time they removed a different portion of the brain, they discovered that they could never remove the memory of how to run the maze. They could impair the rat's ability so it might limp through the maze, but they couldn't remove it. And really, uh, you know, uh, surgeons had known this for a while, doctors had known this for a while, because when people have head injuries, they don't forget half of the alphabet or half of their family or half of the novel they read. They have global memory impairment where their entire memory may be hazy. But memories don't seem to be stored in our heads in the same way that books are stored on a shelf. And it wasn't until the 60s when Krivin encountered the holographic model that says that the whole is contained in every part that he said, aha. This may be what's going on in the brain. Mm -hmm. Specifically, because a hologram is made out of interference patterns, the hologram that you see, you know, that we talked about earlier is made out of the interference pattern of laser light, but it can be made out of the interference patterns of any kind of energy, electromagnetic energy, electricity, uh, x-rays even. And so Pribram said, since our synapses are constantly giving off electrical impulses, 
these are like proverbial pebbles dropping into the sort of electromagnetic pool of our brain. They're sending out ripples that are constantly crisscrossing. And he believes that's what the brain hologram, that's what, how we think and how we remember is through that hologram inside the head. It would uh, apply in another sense too, because if, if you take a hologram image and cut it in half or in quarters or in tenths, each time you reduce it in size, the image becomes fuzzier and fuzzier, even right. though the whole image is there, just the way memory would seem to be. In yeah, it becomes fuzzier when you have portions of the brain in the yeah. Correct. In Pribram then also uh, noticed that the same principle applied uh, for visual information processing. Well, yes, it's very interesting. He did not make the discovery, but he came upon the research done by other, res uh, other investigators. And that is um, another very interesting thing. Uh, as you know, Mother Nature uses all kinds of mathematical languages. That when we go to understand physical phenomena, we generally find that there's some sort of mathematical underpinning, for whatever the phenomena is. There are uncountable mathematical languages. It turns out that the mathematical language involved in the making of a hologram is a, a system of mathematics developed by a French man named Fourier. They're called Fourier transforms. Well, it also turns out that our brain uses Fourier transforms to translate visual information. This is a very unusual state of affairs. It's kind of like discovering Eskimo speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not proof that the brain is a hologram, but it's, it's suggestive that the brain is a hologram. And it turns out, in fact, all of our senses appear to rely on sort of Fourier transforms, that they all seem to use the same mathematics. So again, here's evidence that the brain uses the same mathematics to decipher the sensory world as are involved in the making of a hologram, mm -hmm. which is, as I say, not proof, but compelling evidence that something is going on there. Well, what this seems to suggest is a new way of looking at consciousness itself. Very much so, yeah. Um, it's, and it's an interesting thing. I, I have to say that I differ a little with Pribram because Pribram thinks that the brain, you know, as I said, that it's the electrical interference patterns in the brain that is a brain hologram. I'm kind of a mystic because, you know, at a young age I had an out-of-body experience where I left my body and it became quite apparent to me while I was having this experience that I was thinking, but my brain was back in my body, which I could see in my bed. I knew it wasn't just a dream because I floated out over uh, the ground outside my family's house and I saw a book uh, on, lying on the ground. And it was a book by the French short story writer uh, Guy de Maupassant, and the next day a neighbor said, by the way, Michael, I lost a library book by Guy de Maupassant, have you seen it? And I thought, well, I floated over it last, I didn't tell the neighbor that, but mm -hmm. there, there was the book. And I, I was always very, I'm still very scientifically oriented, I want to understand the world in scientific terms, but it, it, it was the, really the first time that I sort of had to confront, you know, the difference between my spiritual beliefs that we can survive you know, the, our bodily death and this deeply held belief, scientific belief of mine that it's the brain that's doing the thinking. And I realized it was, I had a kind of epiphany where I thought I, it isn't the brain that's doing the thinking. So I, I am not entirely certain that, that it's just the electromagnetic interference patterns that is the brain hologram because those obviously would perish when the brain perishes. I think there might be some subtler level, mm -hmm. uh, some subtler energy that we haven't discovered with our technology that's involved in this also. Well. Bohm's model is uh, relevant and interesting at this point because he's not dealing with the universe as a hologram made out of uh, electromagnetic interference patterns. He's looking at quantum wave potentials, which are right. at a much deeper level. And, and I must say, I've heard Prebrum discuss it much the same way. There are quantum wave potentials in the brain itself, which is, is a much more deeply embedded uh, level of energy and matter than, than the electromagnetic level. Right. Uh, Bohm, it's, it's a funny thing in science, um, uh, the great physicist uh, Herman Bondi said, called it the lure of completeness, that, that we tend, when we find some sort of outermost perimeter to what we can measure, we assume there's nothing beyond it. And I, I refer to it, it's kind of like the, the, you know, in ancient times when we only knew a certain portion of the world, uh, people always seem to say beyond the edge of the map there be monsters, mm -hmm. that there was nothing there. And the same thing is going on in physics, that we have, with our technology, reached down to a certain level in, in reality. And it's a common prejudice among many physicists that beyond that level, there's no, nothing exists. There be monsters. There, there's just a void. And it's, it's an interesting thing that, that we, as I say, we have to have this lure of completeness. We have to feel that our knowledge of the universe is all that exists in the universe. Bowman, I think, is very wisely, is one of the few physicists who comes out and kind of says, the emperor has no clothes. Says, what rational basis do it's just prejudice that we assume nothing exists beyond 
this level of reality. Mm -hmm. And he feels that there are all kinds of, of domains of reality beyond this level, this microscopic level. And he theorizes that there may be untold, uncountable, subtle, subtler energies in these levels. The quantum potential is one. It's a theorized, a theorized field that has not been measured or discovered with science, but Bohm feels there's, there's evidence to posit its existence. See the video description for a link to the full version of Covert Transhumanism. Implanted conscious energy is a very potent and effective technique where electromagnetic signatures are generated inside the mind. Any conscious energy in existence can be reproduced by exotic electromagnetic technology.